remember getting like the the first corner kick of the game like down on that end and like the fans were just going crazy like it was just pumping um yeah it just gives me chills and i just yeah i mean obviously i had to play the game so I, my head was in the game but after the game like hearing the stl chant you know like jake's like i guess it was an own goal the first goal like just like it all happened fast but it was all just yeah just surreal and as i said it was so loud and yeah it just it gave us so much uh energy and excitement for the the season Good morning and welcome to a new edition of the City Voice podcast. I am joined by a very special guest today, Jared Stroud. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on. Um, we've got a lot of questions to cover. Uh, you've had a great season so far. Fans are really excited to get you on and learn a little bit more about you as a person. Uh, so I wanted to um, start off, like everybody's obviously seen you, but I always think it's interesting to hear a player describe um, themselves as a player on the pitch and you know what position they are and like what sort of a player you are so would you be able to give us a, a brief description of, of who you are yeah I mean I think I'm a, a definitely a two-way player I think defensively you know hardworking, um aggressive kind of fit the the style that that we play just you know aggressive trying to win the ball um and then offensively I would just say like efficient you know just trying to get plays off trying to get shots off um, you know, nifty, good in the box. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Brad's described me as like a, an all-rounder. So try and do everything as well as I can. I wouldn't say there's like, obviously there's certain things in my game that I think are better than others, but I'd say like just solid overall. You are really versatile. You show up all over the pitch. You drop into all sorts of positions. Do you have a position that you're like, I love playing in this position. This is mine. When it's on the team sheet, you're like, we're going to have a good day. Yeah, I was thinking about that. And uh, I mean, I think from... You know, from my perspective, I've played a lot of winger. Um, I've played some cam. I've played right back this year, um, left back, center mid, all, 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 pretty much every position except center back uh, in my career. But I would say, like, left wing is typically where I seem to score goals for some reason, maybe cutting in on my right. And then, you know, playing right wing, I feel like it's it's also good, right? It's it's favorable for my right foot to, to get crosses off and stuff. So I think winger, but, I mean, I'm happy to be out there anywhere, honestly. One of the key features of your game and one of the reasons I think our fans adore you and sometimes the opposition fans aren't as favourable is that um, you are master of the dark arts and um, we watch it just little bits like the opposition players. You seem to really ha do well at getting under their skin. Is this is this something that comes naturally to you because you're a fierce competitor or is this is this something that you work on? <laughs> I mean, I think it's something that's natural. I mean, I grew up with three brothers uh you know the way we played in the basement was probably like the stuff that happened down there and the way we tackled each other was probably something that that would not happen on the field you know the way we play here so I think I'm you know just used to that right like just scrapping with my brothers for so many years and and uh that just kind of is, is how I play you know and I play the same way as I would you know I tell people this all the time I'd play the same way I would if uh if I was in my backyard you know playing with my brothers and sometimes, you know, that's not that's not always nice. It's not always, you know, I don't know. I, some people think it's not sportsmanlike, but it's I've never hurt anyone. You know, I've always just played with aggression. And sometimes, you know, I go into tackles a little bit too hard. But I think it's just, you know, part of the game. Uh, but but yeah, as I said, I think it's just natural. Well, City fans love it. Um, we did notice as a as, as a content team something that we wanted to get confirmation on. Versus Sporting KC, we noticed you drinking out of the Sporting KC's water bottle yeah. numerous times. Was this pre-agreed pre or was this part of the uh, part of the game? No, I that actually wasn't. That was just, uh, I'm actually friends with that goalie. Uh, I wasn't trying to get under his skin. Um, no, there, there, there was no bad blood there. He was just, I just told him, I was like, Kendall, I'm, uh, I'm going to take some of your water. And he was kind of giving me some shtick, but it was, it was all in, in good, you know, it, I don't have anything against Kendall. We're actually good friends, but it was just kind of like messing around. And I was actually super thirsty too. So I was just like, Kendall, I'm taking your water. Dude. So just pure practical yeah, reasons. just pure practical. Um, so you are extremely versatile. You can play on the left and right. You defend well and you're a good finisher. Like which aspect of your game, if you don't mind sharing, do you work on? Like, is, is there a part of your game where you're like, I, I, like, I want to be better at this? Or like, particularly now you're like working with Bradley. Like, what's that, if you don't yeah, mind sharing? Yeah, I mean, 
I think a lot of this stuff against the ball comes naturally for me because I, you know, I played for Brad. Um, I played at Red Bull. So, like, I think a lot of guys coming in, that's what they struggle with and that's what they want to learn. But I think that comes naturally for me. So I can just work on, you know, scoring goals and, and being comfortable out there, just working on my first touch, working on half turns. You know, something I've been focusing on this year is just, like, finding ways to, to be in, in the box and get those tap-ins, right? Like, I'm always watching film and trying to see, like, where is the ball going across the box and, and how can I be there? And I think it's, you know, it's led to all three of my goals this year. I've been in the box. Um, just, you know, I've created chances just trying to find different spots in the box um, because that's something that, that, you know, the past couple of years I've, I've wanted to score more goals and, and it's starting to pay dividends. But that's always something I've been working on, I think, and for sure this year. Do you... Um do you look at video analysis of games before to work out how to time your runs or where there will be spaces that should come open? Yeah, I will. And and Brad does such a good job. He'll like, you know, he'll tell us where, you know, the spaces that the other teams are giving up and, and in the box where they're typically giving up goals or, you know, are they giving up a lot of crosses? And so then I'll kind of like go through film, like, for example, like Casey and watch the outside back and be like, you know, which way were guys, you know, beating this guy and, and, you know, is he super tucked in? Is there space behind him? And yeah, I think that's just watching film, just going on Apple TV and, and flicking through and just kind of having it on and, and just trying to get a read for, for where the guy is and where I might be able to score. You mentioned that you're efficient, like just watching you in the warm ups. Like I feel like you get quite excited to be having shots on goal. Like your finishing is really, really good. I mean, you are very efficient with there. Is that something that you pride yourself on? Yeah, yeah, it, it is. I mean, we, uh, I think during COVID, I, I took like, a, I must have taken a million shots because there was like not much else to do with, and with my brothers. And um, yeah, I've just trained it a lot in the off season. And I, I do a little bit less shooting during the season because I don't know, just to, for injury prevention wise. But um, yeah, just, just practicing that, getting reps. And now it's just kind of like coming off well and, and I'm getting good shots. And, and like, you know, against KC, it's hitting the post or I'm giving it a good chance. Um, but yeah, it's something I've worked on for, for a long time and I think now it's starting to, to look good. So I'm excited about it. A lot of young kids listen to um, this podcast. Um, sometimes in football, people say that there are natural finishers and there are people that work on it. Uh, Thierry Henry said that he wasn't a natural finisher and that David Trezeguet was. Do you, um, do you believe that like repetitions and just going at it over and over again, it does sharpen you and get you used to it? Yeah, that, that's actually a good question. Um, I don't know with the natural finishers and I don't know if I am or not. I think like, I don't know. That's a good question. Like De Bruyne and stuff, the way he strikes the ball is, is like super impressive. And I don't know if some of that's natural, but you know that they've been working on it like their whole career. So like if they say it's not natural, they're still, I feel like training it all the time. Um, and for me and for, for, you know, when I was a kid, I just, I just shot the ball all the time in my backyard. And I think like just that, what is it? You know, you just, you don't even think about it. It's just automatic. I think once you get, you know, to that level and that level of practice, then you just like, it's not like something that happens overnight, but you just suddenly feel it and you just strike the ball cleanly. So for all the young guys out there, just, just keep going, right? Just keep taking shots. When you score either on the road or at home, like, is that one of the best feelings in the world? I mean, some of the, some of the places that you've scored must feel pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, scoring in, in, in Q2 was, was cool. Um, and scoring here after like the huge rain delay and then like scoring in the first minute, like, wow, it was, yeah, it was sick. And even like when other guys scored in those, the, the first game ever, like just so loud. Yeah. And the stadium is rocking. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's a, it's a crazy feeling. Like you can't even explain it. it gives me like tingles thinking about, it. but yeah, it's a sick feeling. Definitely. Like one of the reasons you play, you know, as a kid, you're always like dreaming of scoring a goal and celebrating in front of fans and like to do it is like, yeah, I can't even explain it. It's like something you just want more and more of. It's it's crazy. Do you know where you're going to run when you score at home? Do you plot it out before? <laughs> so you're like, I want to be in front uh, of the flags. I want to be in front of the north end. No, it's funny. I mean, before every half, I'll like look at the goal, like from from the halfway line for the ref will like blows the whistle and I'll just imagine myself like I want to score in that goal and then celebrate in front of our, our home stand. Um, so when I did, I was like, yes, like this is like written up and like I knew exactly what I was going to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, to score in front of the, the homestand, I think is, is obviously, I mean, it's cool scoring down there as well. Uh, but to score in front of the homestand is, is sick. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Let's go back to your uh, young life growing up. You had, uh, like a bit of a, a, a decorated, um, college career. Um, but you grew up, grew up in Chesterborough, New Jersey. Um, 
tell us what it was like growing up there. Yeah, it was uh, like rural New Jersey, you know, like just picture like a lot of like woods, a lot of open space, like tons of field, very like not very populated, probably like an hour and 10 minutes outside of New York City, directly west, almost close to, to Pennsylvania. Um, but yeah, just like very quiet. I mean, like, for example, I remember going in our backyard and like just like forest, we could play like airsoft gun fighting and like there was just like a lot of open space for play and like activities, which is, you know, nice for, for me and having three brothers. But yeah, growing up there was peaceful and there was always like fields available. Um, and yeah, we had Red Bull actually it was only 20 minutes. Their facility was only 20 minutes. And then where we played was PDA which was like 20 minutes as well in kind of rural New Jersey. Um, and yeah, I just remember like when my brother turned 17, we all played on PDA and he would like, uh, he would get in the car and all three of us would be in there and he would just drive us up. Like the two younger guys would train for two hours and we would do homework and then vice versa. So that's just what, like what we did, like basically growing up the whole way. So and you're a big soccer family, right? Yeah. Tell us about, uh, some of the DNA in your family and its relation to the, yeah. the beautiful game? Um, my dad came, he came over from England. So he got a scholarship um, to, to play at Bridgeport. Um, and he met my mom there. She's actually just American. She, she, was, she said she played a college game. Nah, no one knows if that's like actually true or, <laughs> or whatever. Apparently they were asking like cheerleaders to play on the women's soccer team or something. And um, yeah, she met my dad and, uh, but yeah, he has the soccer passion, you know, he's always got it on. Like, he's just like a, a classic British dude, you know, he's just obsessed with soccer. Um, no, and that, really. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that like just flowed through, you know, between all four of my brothers and they all, you know, my three brothers, uh, they all played college soccer. Um, we all just kind of had like an initial obsession. Um, and then obviously my youngest brother Pete is playing in the MLS now and, um, you know, Will was, he was going to try and play, but he's still playing. Um, so yeah, I think it, it definitely started with my dad and then, you know, my mom was just like supportive and, um, yeah, she just wanted to support our dreams. So she was, she was obviously super pitiful as well. Who does your dad support in England? <laughs> he supports Norwich City, which is Norwich like, City. Yeah, Norwich City. Um, it's like basically his grandparents, grandparents, they were all farmers in Norwich. Yeah. Um, and so then they had my grandpa and he moved to Bognor Regis. And so they're all still in Bognor Regis. But like a lot of my cousins and stuff are still in Norwich. So we like when I went out there, we, we drove out and watched a Norwich game. It was awesome. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Yeah, yeah it's that's... in the middle of nowhere too. Norwich. Yeah. Did he make you wear Norwich, Norwich kits? That bright <laughs> yeah. yellow. Yeah, we, were, we I still have like a bunch. My nan's like she sends me Norwich jerseys every year. That's like our Christmas gift. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just fun to support a, a team that you have like family from. And even though they get relegated and everything, and it's actually funny because uh, Josh Sargent's there. Um, that must've been a shock when you saw that come through. <laughs> yeah. And then I see rumors he's coming here. I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, but no, like it's, it's a fun team to support. It's like up and down. It's, it's not like a usual team that, you know, everyone supports Arsenal, Man City, but it's fun. You know, everyone's texting me when they get promoted or when they get relegated. So it's all good. And New Jersey is, you know, like St. Louis is a soccer city through and through. Like you come here, like Portland is very similar. You get in a taxi and everyone wants to talk about soccer. New Jersey is a little bit like that as well, like a big soccer heritage. You know, you drive through the back lanes and there are soccer pitches everywhere. Do you think that that was, um, that helped you develop like good quality of coaching and all of those bits? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a super interesting point because there's actually like, when you think about it, there's so many people from New Jersey in the in the soccer world and like even being at Austin, like Claudio Reyna and that whole generation that was born in, I think the Harrison region, basically, like soccer was just so prevalent there. Um, and I think it just flowed out throughout the city or throughout the, the state. Um, and yeah, there's so many good coaches, like even on our team, we have AZ uh, and Jake, like, you know, three New Jersey guys on the team. Like um, there just seems to be a bunch of them spread out throughout the league. And um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting how, how powerful of a, a soccer state it is, like with Tim Howard and the Metro Stars. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's pretty cool. It's kind of like historic. And yeah, I feel like I have ties to, to the guys from Jersey. It's funny. So um, the, you, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the, the Metro Stars, like they were kind of born one year before you were born. I think they played their first professional match the year that you were born was that club always in the back of your mind growing up? Is it kind of like one day 
I might play there. I might get the opportunity. Is that like an extra motivating factor for you? Yeah, I think so. And like, I see kids here today, um, you know, coming to St. Louis games and I kind of see like a version of myself. Like I would go to all the Rebel games. It was when uh, Thierry Henry was there. And like just seeing him in BWP, like just scoring so many goals, like going to playoffs. Like for me as a young player, I was like, wow, this is like, yeah, it was, it was, it was where you wanted to play. But you, you always dreamed of it. You never like thought it was going to be real. And then when it came into fruition and like when I met BWP for the first time, I was definitely like a little fanboy, just like the kids here. And um, yeah, it was special. Playing in my hometown team was, was special. And um, yeah, it was, it was cool. The stadium was, was sweet. And when Thierry Henry was there, it was like packed out houses too. Like people would show up and, and fill the place out. And yeah, it was special. It definitely gave me like a motivation to, to play higher than just, you know, club and college. I grew up with Thierry Henry going. I was an Arsenal season ticket holder, so I grew up watching him. Like the the quality and the charisma that he had on the pitch. I mean, like not like, we. I was so spoiled. You know, he would make half chances look like full chances. The guy was an absolute dream. Yeah. So yeah. interesting to listen to somebody yeah. that also kind of like grew up with him as a bit of an inspiration. Yeah. So let's talk about your college career. I'm going to look at my notes here. Um, you went to Colgate. You racked up 30 assists from 2014 to 2017, two Patriot League tournament championships, one regular season championship, and the program's first ever NCAA tournament win uh, during your time. Um, you also earned uh, a Patriot uh, League tournament MVP honors as a senior after guiding uh, the Raiders to their second straight league title. That's a pretty dazzling career. Um, you were obviously a, a star. Did you have in the back of your head that you wanted to be a pro? Is that part of it? Or do you prove yourself at that level when it's like, oh, maybe I could? Like, what's the what's the thinking going through college? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it starts before college. Like, so when I was coming out, Colgate was like the only school that offered me like a legitimate like scholarship, right? And like, I don't know, I was, I was really a small kid, like underdeveloped, probably like 130 pounds, you know, just like a little bit too small. And I think I kind of got passed over a lot as a as a kid like you know basically no big school offers but this guy Eric Ronning he's the coach still like he came in and yeah he saw something in me and I wanted to go somewhere where where they were going to value me and yeah going there was yeah definitely when 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 you go to a smaller school like part of you your dream is like oh is you know is my dream getting like cut down a little bit, a little bit right like I'm not going to an ACC big school I'm going to a, a really good academic school where soccer's, you know, sports are kind of secondary to academics. So part of me was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. But deep down, I always had that self-belief that, like, regardless of what happens, like, I'm going to make it, you know. And, um, yeah, Colgate, like, we just happened to have a lot of good players around me as well. Like, I got super fortunate. Um, had, like, a great class of guys, like, really good people. They actually, they visited St. Louis -y. The other week, they came to the KC game. Like 15 guys flew they came out. To the KC game. Yeah, oh they came to the KC game. So, but like 15 guys to fly out just to see you. Like I, I just got lucky, right? I had like great, great guys around. Um, and like one of the guys was, you know, Ethan Cutler it was one of the one of the better players I've ever played with, um, or or seen in college soccer for sure. He he actually played at Red Bull with me for two years. So, we kind of like went on this journey, and then like, yeah, I mean, coming out of school, I. I, I knew my senior year, I had a really good season. I had like, I think I had 13 assists in my senior year, which is maybe the most in the country or something. So I was kind of getting like a little bit of hype. But even then, like I was picked in the fourth round. So I was like kind of unsure if this was really going to work. So I think there was always a little bit of doubt. But deep down, I always just kind of drove, drove myself to do more. Um, you know, drove myself to... to you know, I, I had to take initiative, carry, you know, carry the team if I had to with Colgate, um, you know, be, be the driver of a team, you know, and start a new culture there um, and to, to try and win games, to try and do more than, than we've ever done because I knew I wanted to play pro. And the only way to get that was to have, you know, to, to really stand out at a, a smaller program. So, um, yeah, it, it's funny how it all worked out, but it did. And I just I feel like I always had that that deep belief in my stomach that, Regardless of what happens, I'm I'm gonna make it, and we'll just power through. 
It's interesting, and sorry to keep on harping on about Arsenal, but Cesc Fabregas did um, an interview with The Athletic yesterday and he was asked whether he ever had MLS on the agenda and he said no and he specifically stated that the physicality of the league didn't match his game. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the, the the size part. Do you think that that sort of put a bit of a chip on your shoulder? Like being passed over, did that sort of say, well, everybody's missing me missing me here. This is a talent-based thing. I've got that talent. This is what's going to push me forward. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And yeah, I think, I mean, that, it's just always how it is with youth sports. Like if, if a guy looks athletic and he looks promising, he looks like he can play at the next level already, of course they're going to go with, you know, that guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, like similar to, yeah, I mean, maybe not similar to Cesc Fabregas, but... Just like, yeah, exactly. Having the ability, having the skill, having the vision that some coaches definitely saw and my dad and my grandpa definitely saw. And, you know, having someone believe in you through those tough moments, I think uh, definitely drove me through. But but yeah, I think, you know, for all the all the kids in sports today who are, I don't know, maybe they're getting passed over because they're too small or physicality is not their their perfect thing. You you kind of just have to figure out, okay, if I'm not going to be the most physical, then what else can I bring to the table? You know, is it vision? Is it, you know, your skills? Is it, you know, whatever it is, your work rate, um, you know, to bring something else and then use that as, as your driver. So was there, um, was there like a moment like going through college where you're like, this, this is, this proves that I can move to the next level or, or a moment when maybe someone reached out to you, like there was a scout or somebody said something to you and you're like, this is giving me the confidence. I think this is going to happen. Yeah. I think, I think in my summers I played on Red Bull PDL team and I think it was like, it was Jesse Marsh one day we were playing like the PDL team versus the coaches. Honestly, Carnell might've been there. I don't remember, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I remember just like, it was like literally just AV8. Like they were playing for fun, but us PDL guys were like, damn, like I'm playing in front of Jesse Marsh and like Brad and Burpo and all these guys. Like I want to like prove myself. And I don't know, for some reason I just had like a really good day. I think I was like a sophomore in college. And I think Jesse like spoke to me after and was like, yeah, like you have something, like there's something more there. And after that conversation, it just gave me belief that like, yeah, I can, I can do this, you know? And then yeah, I just had some good summers with the Red Bull PDL team and, and knew that that might be an option. But I think it was kind of that moment where it wasn't even like in a PDL game, but it was just like having a coach of that stature tell you that they think you can make it. I think that gave me like the, yeah, that's that's the pushover. And how did the, the Red Bull move come along? Did it, was it kind of expected that you were going to get picked at some point? Was it a little bit, you know, what what was the moment sitting there like watching it sort of unfold? was that like it, it's funny because the first two two rounds like I just watched and they were actually on tv and I was just like I remember just being like gut-wrenched after the first day that I didn't get picked in the first two rounds but like I had some sort of interest from like maybe the Rapids were the only other team but I knew I went to the Red Bull Combine and like had done well and so and I didn't go to the big combine so they knew that maybe they can get me under the radar and I think they mentioned that to my agent at the time um and yeah, the third and fourth round are like, they're actually not even on TV. So like, it was just on Twitter and I was in the shower, like getting ready to go back to school, like disheartened that I didn't get drafted. And my parents were like, no, like you just got drafted. And I was, yeah, I was obviously pumped. But um, yeah, I think when they told my agent that they were going to like sneakily pick me, I knew that there was a chance, but it's just funny how the fourth round and, and third round were just like, so they, were, yeah, they, they had you Twitter, on the radar. Yeah. They had yeah. you on the radar, yeah. and you, you, but they didn't tell you. No, they didn't tell me. Oh, they didn't man. tell me. So I was nervous. So how um, did it mean a lot to you to play in your home state for the club that you've grown up thinking about? Was that like, wow, this is a bonus? Yeah, yeah, it was. Because, I mean, you know, like you go watch them for seven, eight years. Like you idolize those guys, like Robles and BWP and Question. Um, and so, like, to step out there and, like, actually be their teammates and, like, then see myself do well out there was just, yeah, it's a surreal feeling. It's it's almost, like, weird, you know? You're, like, all of a sudden you're, you're believing in yourself that you're going to be, you know, the next guy. You're going to be you're gonna be on this team and now you're going to be, you know, making an impact on this team. Um, so, yeah, it was, I mean, I remember my first day of preseason, like, meeting Brad, Jesse, like all the players, like I was just shaking my hand. Like I was just so nervous, you know, I was coming almost like blacked out, just, <laughs> just so nervous. But once I got used to it and started doing well, it just kind of became like clockwork and just like every other team. But yeah, initially I think you're, 
you're just like starstruck for the first couple of weeks. Did you feel the impact immediately of like the quality levels of like moving up? Was it like, wow, this is serious. This, it, like, th- does it ever start feeling like this is my job now? Or were you kind of like training for that when you were going through college? Um, yeah, I mean, in college it was like the intensity. <laughs> it went from like down here to way up here, right? Like all of a sudden I'm getting tackled by you know, 30 year old men. Whereas like in college you're playing against some like 18 year old, you know, guys who maybe soccer is not even their first like primary interest. Right. So like to then be stepping in a professional environment where it's their job. I remember those first days just like getting like clatter tackled or taking too long on the ball and like just being like, Whoa, okay, this is like, this is another level. Um, but then, you know, as, as, you know, as good players do that, you just got to adapt and and get used to it. But I think those first days, yeah, I was just, I was struck by how fast paced it was. And, and I just realized, wow, I'm playing men's soccer. This is not like for, you know, fun and, and for free anymore. This is, this is your job. Do you have to create like an identity for yourself when you move to a club, like, and figure, do you have to, you know, you move into a new work environment on, in business or whatever. And it's like, okay, who, who, who am I supposed to be in this system? Is it a similar sort of thing in, soccer you go in there and go like work out what's my role or do you take the player that you are at college into the game like how do how do you figure out what your role is going to be in these systems um yeah i think uh yeah i think every team's different right like you you find your role within the team quickly and i think you always have to feel out the locker room and like see where you fall right like when you're coming in as a rookie you know you need to know what level the totem pole you are, you know, like maybe you say a little bit less, maybe you, you know, just get on with your work and try and, you know, prove yourself in the games and and try not to talk too much. And then as you get older, you kind of find like, all right, like, you know, when I walk into the Austin locker room, you know, more of a middle-aged guy, more of like supposed to have more responsibility. I I feel like every team I've gone to when I've stepped into the locker room, there's been like a different feeling, you know, like I think it's just roles and responsibilities. And I think you just kind of naturally, yeah, as you say, with a new job, like you just kind of realize where you fit within the totem pole and then try and, you know, prove yourself. Um, but there's always that like adaption period for sure. Right. Yeah. And then um, your first season there, you played for Red Bull 2 in USL. What did you learn about your game there? Um, yeah, the, I think John Walniak had a huge, huge impact on my career. He like he basically brought me in and, and showed me how to be a, a pro. Um, there's still things that like he taught me like today that I still like use that I was like, wow, okay, this is Wally still, uh, having an impact on my career, but like, you know, nutrition, um, hydration, like all these things that you don't even think about when you're a college kid. Like he taught me, you know, how to act, how to, you know, conduct myself and, and gave me confidence on the field. And, um, yeah, like, you know, taught me how to score more goals, taught me all these things that, in a professional environment, I was able to use and then translate those into the MLS. So it was just a really good stepping ground. I, I think if I didn't have that stepping ground, it would have been really tough to just step into MLS and be expected to, you know, play and start games, especially coming from a little bit smaller of a college. I mean, you made you made that step count as well. First season, 35 appearances, about 3,000 minutes, 15 goals, nine assists is kind of blowout. Like, did you, I mean, you must have been feeling incredibly confident in that system and that must have given you hope that you could move up, right? Yeah, yeah. I think my first year was just gaining confidence, like realizing I can be a good pro. I think that second year when I scored 15 goals, I remember being a little bit more frustrated, you know, like, because I thought I should have been promoted a little bit earlier to the to the first team. Um, so at that point, it was just like I was training with the first team so much that I almost felt like a first team player. Um so yeah, I think it like it just took a little bit more time for me to get bumped to the first team, but yeah, to score 15 goals in a season, I was like, yeah, it just it it made my transition to the first team even easier. So. Still catch any USL games? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I have some some buddies on Tampa Bay Rowdies, and my my friends across the league who are who are on those teams, I definitely will like chime in and watch. So they're fun. What would you say to players making their way in USL? I mean, you had a really successful moment there and you got promoted. I mean, that's got to be inspirational for, for those guys, right? Yeah, yeah. And and USL back then was a little bit different because there was no, like, there was no MLS next team. So, yeah. like, it was pretty good. You were, like, thrown in playing against, you know, ex-MLS guys. Um, but, you know, for those guys, I would just say find, you know, find 
find ways to grow your game in the USL, find ways to be, you know, the best player in the USL so that you can make that transfer to the MLS. Um, but just get minutes, you know, learn, like, that's where I learned the most. I learned, you know, all the like little nuances of the game that you can translate into the MLS. Um, yeah, just, just learn. That's basically the main thing. Learn and yeah, also enjoy it. You know, these games are fun. So you get promoted. Uh, finally, you're, you're in there. Like, talk to me about the, the debut and like, what, what, what were the feelings around that? Were family in the stadium? Like, how did it go? No, it was actually, it was like, it, it was bittersweet because it was, it was like right after COVID. So there's no fans. So I never oh. actually played in Red Bull Arena for the first team with my family there, which was really upsetting. So we played against NYCFC in front of like zero fans. So it, it, it was still awesome. Like we won an MLS game and against like a really good NYCFC team. It was my first game and I started and like Chris Armas gave me this amazing opportunity. Um, so I was pumped. But like there was a bittersweet like, ah, oh, but my family weren't there. But uh, yeah, to win that game was, was pretty cool still. You finished the season with 17 appearances, uh, three assists and uh, some minutes in a playoff game. Uh, did that give you a bit of a taste for, uh, for the high life? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it did. And uh, that was actually the year that Brad took over as, as uh, like he took over midseason and, and we made like a really big push to, to make playoffs. And yeah, it was just like the first taste. And I think making playoffs and then playing in the playoff game just and getting an assist in that playoff game gave me just so much confidence that like, wow, I can be on a team that makes playoffs. You know, wow, I can, I can get an assist in playoffs. And it just, it gave me so much confidence that now, like, you know, when I get back to that spot, you know, I won't want to take that, you know, that game for granted because I think we ended up losing to Columbus and they won it all and, like, we barely lost to them. So seeing that and seeing how close I was in my first year, now when, you know, hopefully this year when we get back to that point, you know, I won't take it for granted and we'll we'll go all the way, but we'll see. Nice. You, uh, you got a first glimpse of Bradley. A lot of people in the game were paying attention to that run that he had. As a player, um... What were your first impressions of Bradley when he was interim? I mean, I just, I knew he was going to be a special coach, you know. Like, as soon as he took over, there were, like, it, it, first off, it was crazy. It was just him. So during COVID, it was only him, Burpo, and this guy, Tony, running the entire team. So, like, I went into the coaching office, and, like, it's this massive room, and it's literally just Brad and these two other guys. And they, like, steered the ship for five six months and like yeah I could just tell he was he was stern you know he was he was all about duels one-on-ones I was like this guy is this guy is perfect for me um and yeah he was such a good motivator like as soon as I had him as a coach I knew yeah I just knew he was gonna be a special coach one day uh and yeah he got us to the playoffs and and you know I don't know how things ended with him at Red Bull because I actually ended up leaving um right after but yeah we just we stayed in touch and um yeah I'll never forget like in the, in his first couple games he wouldn't tell you who was starting in the lineup so like we would show up to the games and like I wouldn't know if I was starting or not like all week and then like I'd find out or not find out and just like kept the players so on their toes uh and I liked it it was like kind of thrilling you know so uh yeah he, he was he was top class well, we will come back to Bradley, but firstly, we have to take a trip to Austin. So you were drafted to Austin, your first out-of-state move. Um, what were you thinking? Expansion club? Like, was it exciting? Like, what, what, was the, what were the vibes? And uh, what, what were you thinking personally? Well, like, I had never been to Texas before. Or, like, well, no, I'd been to Texas. I'd never been to Austin before, so I had no idea what to expect as a city. But I had, like, read about how, you know, basically how fast the city was growing and how special and awesome it was and um yeah it was just and I heard you know it's the only sports team in in the city so I was I was excited because I had heard all of the noise right like the McConaughey everything and then when I got there like it lived up to its hype I mean the the club is first class um the fans like playing in the first game in Q2 was incredible like this is similar to here just so loud you know McConaughey's beating the drums with his like green suit on I was like it was almost surreal, you know. I stepped back and was like, "What is, what is going on?" But uh, no, nah, it was fun. It was, you know, to be a part of an expansion team is really exciting because it's, you know, it's all new, it's all fresh. You have no idea what to expect, and then, you know, the two that I've been to have just blown it out of the park. So, 
it was fun. It was, uh, you know, that first year was, was awesome. It was, did you um, like the city? Was it a fun city to live in? Yeah. City is, you know, it, it's exciting. It's fun. There's, I think, I forget what the stat is, but there's, you know, maybe a hundred, a couple hundred people moving there a day. Like it's just like filled with young people. Uh, just like, yeah, the city, the city's unique too. Cause it's, yeah, very liberal city in Texas and it's, it's unique. Uh, and it's got the lake and everything. It, it was cool. It was a cool place to play. And, uh, yeah, definitely a period in my career that I'll look back and say, yeah, it was, it was fun. Was there one highlight that you're like, oh, that was, that's the moment I'll always remember. I think the, the last game of the season in 2021, like I just particularly had a, you know, I finally had like my really big breakthrough game, like man of the match. And yeah, it was just like, it was kind of a surreal moment for me. Um, and we had like a, a really big win in our last game of the season. I think that was for me the peak, but as I said, I think the first game there too was like, yeah, it was, it was surreal as well. It was very similar to the first game here. So as a connoisseur of expansion clubs, you obviously noticed that St. Louis was picking up. Yeah. Uh, when did, when did you first did, like, do you pay attention to th those sorts of things? Did you, did you know that something was coming down here? Yeah. I mean, I knew that you know St. Louis was the soccer capital of the of the the states, and then it was only a matter of time before they they got their expansion. But yeah, I mean, when they got their expansion, I was just like, wow, this is that sounds cool. That sounds awesome. I bet it's going to be really cool. And then when Brad got the job, I was like, wow, this might be real, you know. Uh, and then when he did, um, yeah, I was immediately interested in, in coming over and. What I, happens? Do you send a, do you, are you on the DMs <laughs> with him? Like what goes on? Or do you just wait uh, and just like, wait by the phone? <laughs> no, when he got the job, I think I just texted him saying like congrats and stuff. Uh, I wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like the time for me to move yet, but I was just like, congratulations. And then when the time for me did come to move, um, yeah, I obviously knew the, the special, you know, this, you know, the fans, everything. I, I kind of had an idea that it would maybe be similar. Um, uh, to Austin so I think when the time came I definitely was you know I could have basically left in July last year and gone to another MLS team for the last six months but I was like ah, I want to go to St. Louis so like I told you know Austin like I want to go to St. Louis I want that trade um I'll wait six months just to play on that team uh and so yeah when it happened I was yeah I was ecstatic and did he go like did he call you up to sort of like sell you on the vision or is it like listen you know what the vision is because you've already played on the vision yeah, he he was like this. I mean, he just told me he was like, this is going to be special. And I mean, I took Brad's word for it. And I, I have some friends in St. Louis and they were kind of telling me the same thing. And um, yeah, I kind of I, I heard that from Brad and I was like, I trust this guy. I'm, I'm going there. And so, uh, yeah, I don't I don't like I didn't listen too much to the media and hype, but I saw that the stadium was basically already built, too. And and that for a player is, is huge, right? To, to already have a stadium, soccer only, downtown. I was like, that's, yeah, I want to go there. Well, there, do you have um, any reservations? Like, is there, um, are there any concerns moving to an expansion club? Or are you like, listen, I've, I've already done it once, <laughs> might as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I've already done it once. And, you know, our first year in Austin wasn't, like, I just knew that I wanted to redeem myself too. Like, I saw what I maybe could have done that first year in Austin and I definitely helped that team progress into what it is and, and I'm proud of it, but I wanted to come to St. Louis and, and, and just, yeah, give my expertise. I mean, just give my opinion when I can, um, and, and help the team. Cause yeah, exactly. I've already seen what it looks like as an expansion team and like, and yeah, especially this team already having a city two team last year and already having a culture, I kind of knew that it might already be different, you know, than what, what happened in Austin. Um, and then once again, as I said, like knowing Brad was here and knowing the way he coaches, I just knew that it was going to be better than most expansion teams for sure. And what, uh, th that, that is really interesting that like you can bring expertise of like been there, done that. And it's like, what, I mean, no, no, we love Austin, but it's like the, they, they had a difficult first season. Our season has been very, I mean, record breaking yeah. good. Like, are there any key elements that you would say? Because it obviously worked for Austin's second season. Like, are there any are there any key elements here where you're like, this is this is a major difference, and this is why it's working well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so much like so many mini details, but yeah, I think in Austin we we particularly struggled as well because it was during COVID. I don't think we ever got like 
the preseason that we had here. You know, the like the guys here already like when I showed up, I was really impressed at the culture that had already been set. You know, it wasn't like Austin where I was walking into a brand new locker room where there's no culture, no nothing. Like no one knows even how to run. You know, I mean, guys know what an, uh, a successful MLS team is, but no one knows how to make an ex- you know successful expansion team. But coming here and already seeing that culture, um, and seeing so much of it in place, I was shocked, and I was like, "Wow, I actually, there's not that much for me to even say because it seems like this team already has so much, and now it just needs to add to that and push it forward in a, in a good way." Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I was I was just impressed by what they had already created here um, and what was already set. But uh, yeah, it was impressive. When you landed in the car park day one, like what were your, what was your sort of key takeaway from like wandering around, like seeing the stadium, seeing the training facility, like meeting the players? Yeah. um, Yeah. I saw Brad was, you know, I had worked with him before, saw Tim had worked with him before. So uh, had already, you know, felt like I knew a couple people here, like Gasparoni and some of the guys in the background as well. So like, I already felt like I knew a couple people and yeah, seeing the, I mean, obviously the stadium and the, the facility, seeing that for the first time, I was like, wow, this is, it's already here, you know, it's already, it's just ready to be, to go. Uh, and yeah, it was so impressive. Like I remember just looking over the Ferris wheel the first night I got here and just seeing the, the facility, the stadium and just being like, wow. Like it's all here and it's I'm ready to go. I was just excited. Uh, the Ferris wheel is an unexpected delight. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. when it reflects off of the glass, it looks beautiful. Yeah. Um, a lot of the players um, that we've had on the the City Voice podcast have have mentioned that something feels special about the squad, about the dressing room. Um, I just wanted to get your take because you all look like you enjoy playing with each other. There's a lot of respect on the pitch. Like it feels like it's. Um, very competitive but good vibes like you've you've played in a lot of dressing rooms like what 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 makes a dressing room stand out as a as a pro yeah I mean the guy I mean the guys are just all so kind and uh you know like just great guys I mean it's it's hard to like put a finger on it but they're all like we don't seem to have huge egos we don't seem to have like you know any big problems in training like we don't we don't have anyone lashing out. Uh, we just have guys who are working hard, you know. It, it, it kind of fits, like, the city. Just guys are showing up every day and uh, and doing their job and, and enjoying the team camaraderie. And, you know, when you're not playing, you're supporting the guy. And when you're playing, you're giving it all, you know, for the team. And, yeah, I've never been on a team where it's been, like, you know, every time I run by a guy, like, high fives, everything, just, you know, uh, just a great culture. And you can tell that the coaches and, and Lutz and everyone, and it starts with the ownership. They all just, you know, they picked good people. And, um, yeah, we went through preseason and we got like intimate, you know, we talked about our, everyone had stories, everyone, you know, talked about, you know, their life and we kind of really got to know each other and yeah, to get each other, you know, to get to know each other on that, that level and, and to become such good friends in preseason and then just translate it onto the field. Yeah, you just you want to run through a brick wall for these guys. It feels special. It feels different. Um, you know, I've been on teams where there's been like language barriers, um, egos, all sorts of, you know, other issues on, you know, my whole career. And to, to come somewhere where I'm like, wow, like, am I the bad guy? You know, like these, everyone here is so kind. Like this is. Yeah, it's 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 super special. Certainly uh, translates onto the pitch. It looks like you all, have, you know, you do yeah. go to war for each other. It's great yeah. to see. Um, life has a, a way of throwing up interesting moments. The schedule comes out, and who is our first game away from home? It's Austin. What what did the what was uh, what did that feel like? I mean, it sounds like you you know you have a lot of respect for them, but you see them on the on the list. Was that exciting? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because, yeah, I see it and I'm just like, seriously, like, I go, I just, you know, maybe a little bit of a break, you know, something. But of course, the first game, I'm like, all the guys are texting me from Austin. Oh, see you, you know, see you first game of the year. And yeah, like I was at two of the guys' weddings this off season. They're just like, you know, laughing about it. And yeah, and then all of a sudden, like it creeps up and I'm like, wow, I have the first game I'm playing for St. Louis. I have to go play my my old team, like my, all my boys, all my friends. Um, and yeah, it was, it was an emotional game for me. It was like, yeah, it was like so weird just warming up on the other side of the field. Like I felt like I was just there and I was like 10 weeks ago. Um, 
so it was weird. It was emotional. It was like, it, it was, you know, it was a weird game. Like we won, but like, those are my friends, you know, it was very like, yeah, mixed bag. But, um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm glad we won. We got our first one in history, but yeah, it was just like, had to play Austin the first game. It was funny. And everyone, everyone wrote off St. Louis in that game, like away from home against a team of that quality. It was a brilliant game. Um, how special was it in the dressing room after? And especially because you had a, you know, a consequential moment in the game that like, you know, it, it, it helped us win the game. Was that, was it like, the, w did it feel perfect or like, was it like a bittersweet? Yeah. I mean, I think it was just the way it was, right. It was, you know, it was all written to be and it just, you know, it, it played out in in a good way for the team. I think, you know, as a team, all the MLS pundits had us finishing in last place, right? So I think as the team, we, we almost like shocked ourselves. We were kind of like, wow, we can we can beat the best team at their place, you know? Like, I think guys were kind of like surprised almost after the game, but then we kind of realized, wow, we are we're a real team. We're actually going to be super competitive this year and we're actually going to be really good this year. Um, and yeah, to have that feeling in the dressing room after was surreal. And I think just gave us belief, you know, just like pure happiness, um, almost like a weight off our shoulders, you know, that we're not going to be the last place team in this league, like no chance after the way we just played. So we felt good about it for sure. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a special moment, you know, Brad's first, you know, win as a head head coach and yeah, there was just so many like special things going on. Um, and yeah, for me, as I said, bittersweet, but at the end of the day, super just pumped to, to, to have gotten our first win for the, the St. Louis community. So unexpected, um, the, the unexpected feelings carry through again. What's, what's this going to be like when it's full and, you know, not like 26 degrees, like it was for the, the Leverkusen game, another, um, another first sort of home opener for you. Like, what was it like? Uh, walking onto the pitch here and what was that experience like um, for you personally? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, it gives me the chills. It was, it was so loud. That's the only thing I remember. It was like, this is so, I don't know if the, the sound was like condensed in, but it was so loud. I remember getting like the, the first corner kick of the game, like down on that end. And like the fans were just going crazy. Like it was just pumping. Um, yeah, it just gives me chills, and I just, yeah, I mean, obviously I had to play the game, so I, my head was in the game, but after the game, like, hearing the STL chant, you know, like, Jake's, like, I guess it was an own goal, the first goal, like, just, like, it all happened fast, but it was all just, yeah, just surreal, and as I said, it was so loud, and yeah, it just, it gave us so much uh, energy and excitement for the, the season that this is what every home game is going to look like, uh, and then to, you know, deliver a win to the St. Louis community who longed for soccer for so long, you know, it felt like we were just, you know, giving the fans what they deserved. Um, and yeah, it just felt like a surreal night. And um, you, you played in front of incredible fans. I mean, the, I, I was at the um, Q2 and the noise that is made in that stadium in Austin is wild. Uh, we're half a season in, how do you rank the noise here compared to anywhere that you've played in North America? I mean, it's, it's, I think it's here in Austin have got to be the loudest. I mean, from what I've seen and where I've played, I'm trying to think if there's any louder. I mean, maybe Atlanta, you know, during their expansion year when they had like 75,000 in that dome, but I mean, it's, it's got to be up there in the top for sure in the MLS. Uh, and yeah, the fans here just seem, they just seem louder than other places we play. I mean, I think our home record, you know, speaks to it, but... Is it, uh, does it um, help you? Oh, it helps us so much, yeah. Yeah? Especially the way we play, like aggressive, on the front foot, you know, when you're chomping at the bit to, to press another team and you have, you know, our fans behind you, you're just like, yeah, you're just, you feel like uplifted almost. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it gives us, it gives us another, you know, another level and uh, yeah, the fans are awesome. And you seem to have found a fantastic level this season. You're getting a lot of minutes three goals, um, four assists. Like personally, how do you feel that the season's going and um, do you do you feel that you're, you know, do you feel yourself here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the the system fits me super well. I think the the way that 
you know, we play and, uh, you know, Brett as a coach, I think fits me, fits my style perfectly. And I think the stats, the chances I'm getting, um, you know, the way that I'm playing is just getting better and better. And I think credit to Austin too. Like I basically spent two years at a team that's all about having the ball, you know, how do we break down an opponent? How do we, you know, use the ball to manipulate the other team? And it's, it's not less, you know, focused on defending, but I'd say it's more focused on, you know, attacking, you know, and that gave me, um, you know, a lot of confidence going forward this year. And I think that's led to goals and assists. And, you know, my, my ability with the ball has gotten better. And then, like, adding my defensive part of the game um, and the way we play and the way Brad, you know, wants us to play, I think is just – it's a perfect combo for me. Um, and, yeah, I just want to keep doing it the rest of the season. I want to just – I mean, my main thing is always to, to win games, right? I want to – you know, I want this team to get a home playoff game at this point in the season, for sure. We, we're in a good spot, too. So, um, yeah, number one priority, get a home playoff game, win games. But, you know, for my personal game, yeah, I'm excited and, and I want to score more goals, want to get more assists. We are uh, – this, 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 is a, this is a new squad. Um, like, you are, you're building up your winning IP. There have been ups – major ups in this season then there have been some downs the media are always talking about you know have St. Louis City been sussed um but we're halfway through the season now we're in a great position um what what do you learn in the good times and what what have you learned in the it, it, not so good times like have, it, it feel like you've had a lot of things go on in a small space of time yeah I mean I mean this is my what sixth year now of professional soccer every season comes with huge ups, huge downs, you know? And for me, it's always, all right, if we lose, you know, what am I taking away from that game? Like, how did we lose? You know, how can we be better? Um, how does it have to look different so that we don't lose again, right? Like, and then even when we're winning, I feel like Brad, the staff, all the players are doing a good job of, of not letting that get too much, you know? Even when we're winning games, we're still watching, you know, film on what we could have, you know, how we could have prevented chances given up, uh, we're always trying to improve. So I think like we've done a good job with the media, like just not, not letting it into the locker room. Right. And I think that's always an important thing, especially for a new team. Right. Because people are going to say, Oh, they're not actually good or, Oh, wow. They're doing better than they should. That's always going to be the narrative. So for us, it's about not focusing on the media, not focusing on things that we can't control. It's just focusing on how we can get better, um, how we can win more games. Um, realizing that we have an amazing opportunity. I don't think many teams come to the, this position of the season um, eyeing down a home playoff game, right? So we have to, you know, seize the opportunity, continue to get better, and, uh, yeah, basically keep the media out of it. Great. Um, personally, what would a successful season look like, or is it the home playoff? I mean, home playoff, I would, I would take home playoff and no more goals, no more assists, no more nothing, right, <laughs> over anything. Um, to give these fans a home playoff game is would be that's number one goal priority for sure. Just to make playoffs is priority now at this point in the season. Um, but personally, yeah, I mean, I think if I can get up to eight goals, eight assists, I think we're at the halfway point. If I can get to four and four before the halfway point and and get more goals and assists, I think it's just going to help the team. So just trying to produce more, trying to get you know more assists um, because goals change games, right? Um, and just, you know, and that basically starts with just being super dangerous, you know, creating chances, listening to the coaches, playing good defense, all of that translates into to good stats. So statistically, yeah, it would, it would be sick to score eight goals for sure. Brilliant. And I mentioned at the top of the show that a lot of young people listen to these podcasts. You've had a really interesting uh, career so far, like you're a hero to a lot of kids that watch you um, who play the game in this uh, America's first soccer city. Um, what advice do you have for um, you know kids that are sort of playing in city futures? Maybe they're in the academy, or, or or maybe they haven't been seen yet. Like, what advice do do you give to them if they're trying to make it in the game? I mean, number one, you always have to to enjoy it. You know, you have to to figure out why you play. You know, like does it make you happy? For me, like I love playing soccer because of the team camaraderie. You know, the thrill of trying to win games, and like just you know straight up the exercise, you know, playing every day for me, it's therapeutic, you know, it's, it's why I love the game and, you know, made so many friends within the game. And that's always the reason I play is, you know, for, to meet people, um, you know, the cultures, uh, 
that's that's always the reason you got to play is, is to have fun, you know, to try things, to, I don't know, try and score goals. Whatever you want to do in the game, just enjoy it. Um, and then if you want to take yourself to the next level, you know, you have to work super hard. Um, you have to work when no one's watching, you know. I've put countless, countless hours um, playing in my backyard. Uh, when I was at college, I would go to the squash courts and just play alone or with anyone, right? I would do anything to play. Um, so yeah, no, that always leveled my game and it was always enjoyable for me. So just enjoy it and work hard and see where you can get better and see how far you can go because it's fun. Great advice. Yeah. Um, finally, you are a fan favorite. Um, I love watching you personally. You leave it all on the pitch. Um, I'd love it if uh, we could finish this podcast off with you giving a, a bit of a message to the fans that you know adore you and watch you every week. I would just say thank you so much, guys, for for supporting us. Uh, when we win, when we lose, I mean, we've lost two games at home, and you guys have still been there for us. And yeah, we just we want to deliver for you guys every week. And but we're so appreciative of them, you know, and we're so thankful for them. Uh, when we win and when we lose, we're we're just grateful to have you know the best fans in the league. We we really do. Uh, uh, they're incredible. Keep keep staying behind us. You know we're gonna have some. You know, hopefully a lot more good moments than than bad moments at the end of the season. But we're gonna give it our all. And if you guys keep yelling in the stands, we'll we'll keep winning games. So we'll do our best. There you go, City fans. Um, Jared, that was uh, a brilliant conversation. Thank you for being so open and for offering um, so much to the fans. They're gonna really like that. And if you are listening, make sure you drop a five star review on iTunes or Spotify. Um, because if you do, then maybe Jared will come back um, in the second half of the season to talk about where we're at. Uh, and on that note, we'll say ciao for now. Thanks for listening. Thank you.